uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk about kidney cancer, something I like talking about. But also when I was reflecting on what I would talk about today, I was thinking about the fact that last time I spoke at this conference, I had been up late the night before watching the Celtics lose to the uh, Lakers, the Game hated seven. Los Angeles Lakers, and, uh, and that was kind of a bummer. So, so we're kind of riding a high here today. And, uh, the Boston area is, uh, is still a little bit euphoric. Um, Okay, so I thought I would start by um, just showing, because sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words, and um, the thousand words are really to convey what, what it is that drives us to be excited about this research and excited about trying to develop new and better therapies for <coughs> cancer. And so this is just a simple two CT scans here. And what I'll point out to you, so this one uh, that I've got the arrow on right now, um, if you're not used to looking at a CT scan, the patient's lying on his back. And so this is his chest up here in the front, and this is his spine back here. And, uh, and um, what you see here on this side is you see a, a big dark area with some white streaks in it. And you'll trust me that, that that's what a normal lung looks like. Any uh, basically air, which is what's supposed to be in the lung, uh, looks dark on a CT scan. So that's a lung, one lung you can see that's, um, that's nice and expanded. <clears throat> okay, sorry about that. We'll use the point. So what you can see on this other side here is that you see something that looks quite different. And what you don't see is any dark areas of well-inflated lung. So that patient um, had metastatic clear cell renal cell carcinoma. And uh, before starting treatment, you could see that one lung field was entirely filled with fluid and collapsed lung some cancer, and that's because of the cancer. So you can imagine that that sort of situation brings shortness of breath, sometimes it brings discomfort on that side of the chest, and uh, clearly a patient that needs treatment. And uh, if you look here in the middle, this is what I'm kind of circling right here, this is the heart, and you can see that the heart is not even at the center of the chest, it's kind of being pushed over to one side by all the space that's being occupied by that fluid. And then what you see here is after three months of therapy with Sutan, which is a drug we'll talk about, what you can see is that not everything is perfectly symmetrical yet, but you can see that the heart's kind of there in the middle of the chest. You can see that that area that used to be totally white with fluid and collapsed lung is now starting to have some nice dark areas of well-expanded, well-aerated lung that can do its job. So when you think about the fact that we can give, and at times we can give a pill that will cause this kind of a change, this kind of a global improvement in what's going on, that's an exciting thing. So that's what, that's what we're really going to be talking about. So a primer on renal cell carcinoma, what makes it different from other cancers? So we think about other cancers like colon cancer and breast cancer and some of these other ones. What gives us our kind of our own category here with renal cell carcinoma? So a few basic things that make it quite different is the conventional chemotherapy, what we call cytotoxic chemotherapy. And that's the kind that you think about when you think about breast and colon cancer and some of those others. It's just never worked very well for renal cell carcinoma. And it's not for a lack of trying. So, so we'll be talking about targeted therapies. But in the era before we had targeted therapies available, the main thing we had in our armamentarium to try was regular plain vanilla cytotoxic chemotherapy. So you can look back in the medical literature and see lots of trials where these things were tried and they never produced uh, never produced the kinds of responses that we really were looking for. So that's one thing to know. So it's just different in that way. Uh, another thing is immunotherapy. So Dr. McDermott was talking about immunotherapy a little bit. And immunotherapy, at times, can produce durable, amazing responses. And, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, how to select patients that should be tried uh, for these uh, therapies. But it's clearly not uh, a strategy that works in all, but really a subset of patients with renal cell carcinoma. And then uh, finally, we, uh, another, another kind of curveball when it comes to RCC is that usually, even if the cancer has spread to other parts of the body, often we'll still have a surgeon remove that primary tumor uh, because sometimes that will cause, so for a couple reasons, sometimes that will cause a regression, a shrinking of the other parts of the cancer in the body, and, uh, and also it seems to produce a survival advantage by doing that. So that's something that's stra strategically quite a bit different about kidney and about a lot of other cancers we treat. And so what I have here is a CT scan showing 
This is one of my patients that had uh, what, what's circled here is a lung metastasis, uh, but we really started by leaving that on the back burner, taking out the primary tumor, and then getting on with uh, medical treatments. So, so I'll give you a brief primer on immunotherapy. Dr. McDermott talked about it a little bit in his talk as well. So, so the concept really is, to my mind, RCC, a renal cell carcinoma, is really in its own category in that chemotherapy has never really produced the kinds of benefits that we look for from our treatments. And so what we know is that immunotherapy can actually can produce benefits in some patients. And, uh, and there's a lot that could be said about how it works or how it might work. Uh, what we think it's doing is uh, activating some of our own natural immune system, T cells, natural killer cells, and other mechanisms to fight against the cancer. Um, and uh, a couple of the drugs that you may have heard of in this category would be interleukin-2 and uh, interferon alpha. And so I thought I'd take a minute to talk a little bit specifically about high-dose interleukin-2. And uh, the reason that this one is particularly worth talking about is because uh, it has the potential to do what other treatments that are currently available can't do. Is in a subset of patients, it will cause a, a durable remission, where even many years down the road, the cancer's gone and it hasn't come back. Uh, that's the good part. The difficult part is the side effects. So patients who receive high-dose IL-2 because of the side effects, they need to be hospitalized and monitored, and sometimes they even end up going to the intensive care unit in order to get drip medications to keep the blood pressure up. So it's something that's not a casual endeavor. It's something that has to be offered to just the right patient in just the right circumstance. And that's something that, uh, that you would have to talk about in great detail with your, uh, with your oncologist. But I would say the bottom line when it comes to high-dose IL-2, it's problematic. It's a, difficult, it's a difficult treatment to endure, but at the same time, it has potential benefits that simply cannot be ignored. Uh, so that's, that's your very, very brief primary on <coughs> immunotherapy. Well, what about targeted therapy? That's, that's uh, something that we all get excited about. So uh, we'll, do, we'll start, I won't, I won't torture you with a lot of vocabulary, but I, I think a few terms are worth knowing, and they kind of help you speak the language that we're always speaking when we're talking about these drugs. And so, again, I have a CT scan here, and uh, what you can see here, if you'll trust me, this is the appearance of a normal kidney over here. Uh, so on that side, if you have that burned in your memory as what a normal kidney looked like, uh, you can go to this other side and see this huge kind of heterogeneous looking mass here on the other side, and uh, you'll see that that is that's a kidney tumor, and that does not look anything like a normal kidney. And why do I point that out? Well, it is relevant to some of the terms that we're going to be talking about. So number one, the first term that I think, and I'm only going to give you three on this slide, and I think they're all worth knowing. So the first term that I think is worth knowing is angiogenesis. And so what that is, the concept is, angiogenesis is the process of recruiting and making new blood vessels. So if you think of this very large tumor there on your right on that CT scan, you can imagine that in order for a tumor to start microscopic and grow to be that size, it needs a lot of nourishment. It needs a lot of fuel for that fire. And so the thing, the thing that the surgeons could have told us, even before we had any molecular understanding of how this takes place, the surgeons could always tell us that when they operate on a renal cell carcinoma, there tend to be a lot of blood vessels. They tend to be very vascular. They're, they tend to be very good at recruiting the blood supply they need in order to grow like this. And so the medical term, the medical term we use for that is angiogenesis. So that's one thing. The second term, and this is, a, this is kind of a jargon type term that, uh, that, that also I think is worth knowing, is VEGF. So you'll, if you'll see it, if you, if you search for this stuff on the internet, VEGF is just all four letters capitalized. But we pronounce it VEGF. And the reason that's important is that's the very important signal, or one of the important signals, that the tumor sends out in order to recruit those blood vessels. And we'll be talking more about that. But that's, VEGF is kind of the signal that causes angiogenesis to happen. And then finally, the third term here is targeted therapy. And that's when, when we say, if you'll trust me, that VEGF is an important signal that helps promote this angiogenesis, this process of building new blood vessels. And if, you, if, I say, if I tell you that that's very important, this process, and that's a big part of how these tumors get so big and grow so fast, 
then it makes sense to 